Hi, everybody. <laughs> All right. So I've just been suffering from a bit of anxiety this week. Um, and originally, I really wanted to do this live stream with a couple of people, but they're a bit busy, a bit hungover after um, St. Patrick's Day. So I thought I would get started by myself <laughs> doing the analysis of the script of Alien. Um, I'm not sure whether a lot of other uh, podcasts have got into this yet, but th this is something that like I've always wanted to do myself and I always would like to get some input from other people. So yeah, I thought I would get started on it today. So uh, for people who don't know me, uh, my name is Clara. You can call me mother and I am going to go through Alien script by Dan O'Bannon. Um, and if you'd like a copy of the script, you can get it off AVP Galaxy in their download section. That's where I printed it off from. So on the front there, you've got, it's a photocopy. So you've got a faded sleeping chair of Dan O'Bannon's on the front and it says synopsis on last page as well. So the story is by Dan O'Bannon and Ronald Chissette. One of the first things I wanted to cover off is the, the cast of the characters. So for people who don't know, originally um, the characters' names were very different to the ones that we know from the movie Alien. You know, I'll just hold up the list here. Uh, as you can see, uh, there are different names. So for the captain, instead of Dallas, we have standard Chaz and instead of Ripley we have uh, Martin Roby uh, as the navigator instead of Lambert we have Del Brassard or Brassard Del and uh, instead of I think Kane uh, we have uh, Melconis um, so Sandy Monconis, sorry, I've been saying the names backwards. <laughs> I'm trying to read through the paper. All right. Sorry. Um, and then we've also got, um, uh, what is it? Uh, Cleve Hunter and Jay Faust, the mining engineer and the engine tech, which I believe is Parker and Brett. And what something that you may notice is that Ash isn't on there. Um, so Ash was added later on by Ridley Scott, I believe. So uh, on the bottom, I will draw your attention to this, right? Uh, and I didn't even know this was on there. It was uh, pointed out to me by Aaron Percival of AVP Galaxy. And it says the crew is unisex and all parts are interchangeable for men or women. And you may know that with um, Ridley Scott, he usually takes, uh, what you call it, um, <laughs> takes responsibility for changing uh, the sex of Ripley over from a man to a woman. And um, it was actually suggested by 20th Century Fox to Ridley and then Ridley doubled down, doubled down on it. And um, at the end of the day, uh, uh, even though... Um, Dan O'Bannon's the writer, uh, there's other people he needs to get approval from and that's people like the studio and the studio makes decisions on um, who should be named uh, or who should be like a man or a woman, I guess. Uh, and this was before casting happened. So there you go. If you didn't know, uh, Ripley was Roby. Now, when you read the characters of Alien, because they were kind of made unisex and their parts were interchangeable. People always talk about the characters being more in depth and realistic. And I think that holds true. And I think that's something that people in, uh, who write the alien movies in general from now on, try to keep the characters, uh, nuanced and full. And they write them as if they could be either a man or a woman, except in the, case that you have a woman being pregnant like Shaw and having <laughs> uh, the trilobite removed. But 
in Alien, they were written unisex. So I think that's what really worked for the characters. So Chaz Standard, a.k.a. Dallas, uh, is a leader and a politician and believes that any action is better than no action. And I think that really defines Dallas's character, you know, crawling into the vent and taking charge and, and trying to sort out the, the problem. Um, he is not the type of person in authority who would kind of sit back and do nothing. And um, I think they also brought that out in future captains as well to either their benefit or their detriment. So you have people or characters like um, uh, Oram and um, uh, Yannick and uh, who else was the captain? There wasn't really a captain in um, two and three. There was like the ship was self-captaining with the Sulaco. I guess you could say um, that some of the Marines were captains in a way, like leadership captains. Um, like you've got, um, oh, you've got like lots of people. You've got um, the, the uh, lead, um, sorry, the, <sighs> I'm so bad with names right now. <laughs> you've got um, the, the people who are leading uh, the retaking of Hadley's Hope, but I don't know. It's it's a fight between the company and a fight between the Marines. So there's there's several leaders that people are following. Um, but I would say the ultimate leader would have had to be... Um, oh, I'm so bad with names right now. I've got too many things going on in my mind. I'll, I'll remember it in just a sec. <sighs> okay. Uh, one of the things um, that I wanted to point out as well is that uh, immediately you can see from here that Roby is marked as the survivor. <laughs> uh, cautious but intelligent. Um, I can't say that that has been the case for everyone in the prequels. I think only in Alien Covenant it would stand out that at the end there wasn't really any survivors. Um, and also for uh, Alien 3 as well, <laughs> just because of the way um, the final survivor survived, because Ripley went and chucked herself into hot boiling lead. <laughs> uh, then you've got the navigator, who's Del Brassard, and uh, it says adventurer and brash glory hound. I don't know if they characterise Lambert as that. She seemed the opposite of that. So I would say that they did kind of change her character when she went from just a regular navigator to, I guess, a navigator who was a woman, which I think is a bit sexist, <laughs> but they, they needed someone who played opposite to Ripley, who was like cool, calm and collected. And um, Lambert was uh, panic attacked. And, and they kind of like switched over that sort of trope in Aliens, because Hicks was the one who was um, a, a bit of a, <laughs> I wouldn't say worry wart, but a bit of a stress head and kind of like losing it. Whereas um, the young girl and Ripley, uh, Newt and Ripley were like very cool, calm and collected. All right, then we have the communications tech, uh, Sandy Malconis intellectual and a romantic i would say that that kind of suits the way that kane was written later uh when they say a romantic they're talking about romanticism as a period not romantic as uh i don't know that the way that people think of romance these days uh it's a bit more different and i guess they changed uh, Kane visibly to someone who is into philosophy so that just explains to you um, maybe the roots of why Alien Covenant is the way it is in terms of aesthetic because you're looking at uh, romanticism or the ro uh, uh, Byronic or romantic characters um, and philosophical characters <laughs> uh, and then we've got um, Cleve Hunter the mining engineer and Jay Faust, the engine tech. So Cleve Hunter is obviously Parker because he's high strung, 
came along to make his fortune because he's always asking about the bonus situation. Um, and then there's Jay Faust, the engine tech, uh, worker and unimaginative. And that's why he always co copies um, Parker. He's always saying, you know, right. <laughs> always copying him and not really showing um, any individual thought for himself. I'm sorry if this is boring, you guys. Um, I'm going to keep plodding along until my heart kind of tells me that I need to stop talking because I'm kind of shaking from the amount of um, anxiety my body's going through at the moment, but I'm going to pull through. It's just a combination of like stuff that's been happening on the internet, the terror attacks that happened in New Zealand, um, just the gen general feeling that I usually have to go through to kind of put myself in the mood to be able to talk and stream to people. People don't understand that um, it can be a bit stressful. Uh, and just having a bit of negativity from some people in the fandom, um, having to deal with that and then kind of keep on doing what I do. So I'm still trying to organize stuff for the Alien Day giveaway. I'm still trying to organize stuff for my Patreon. And I'm still trying to sort out everything for the studio, which happens on Wednesdays and Thursdays. So I'm, I'm pretty... I'm pretty flat out, but at the same time, I don't want to kind of neglect, I feel that is my duty to reach out to people in the fandom and talk about why I love Alien or why other people would as well. Anyway, I'll stop blabbering on. Uh, I wanted to go to the star map, which Dan O'Bannon drew up. Um, I can show it to you here. And just a reminder for those who are just joining now, you can get a copy of this script of AVP Galaxy in the download section. It's the first script that they have, which is written by Dan O'Bannon and Ronald Chisett for Alien. All right. So one of the interesting things um, that I've noticed with this star map and after watching uh, the prequels and stuff like that is that there is an outer... Uh, the outer rim, which uh, Dan O'Bannon says is uh, 108 light years in diameter. So people might recognize that this isn't actually all that accurate. You can find these sorts of accuracies. I'll, I'll share the links to you in here because it's just too, it's too full on to go through right now when we're just talking. <laughs> so, uh, uh, an interesting thing to note is that, just hold on one tick, um, and I'm sorry about my mechanical keyboard, I know some people don't like how noisy it is. I'm going to look at getting a quiet one that I can use when I'm just streaming with you guys. So. All right, just give me one tick. Sorry again. Oh, the good thing is I've stopped shaking so much. I really appreciate people's patience with me. <laughs> while I'm suffering from anxiety. I don't know if there's anyone out there that has um, these issues, but I do. Makes my life hard, but not as hard as people who have to live with it every day. It only happens to me once in a while. And I can, I can kind of take it. <laughs> takes a bit of getting used to.
All right. I can't seem to find the information that I was supposed to have for this part, so I'm just going to skip past it. Um, there is a, a sector um, that they talk about in um, Alien Covenant where Planet 4 is located. I think it's sector 106 or perhaps it is 108 can't really find the information right now, but I'll get it for you later. Um, but I think that when they made uh, a reference to that, they were actually referencing the original map from Alien. Um, it says that there is 1,650 star systems in the outer, uh, 46 soul types, which I guess is like the same sun uh, planet type interrelationship that we have with Earth and the Sun uh, with over 20,000 planets. Um, things that are mapped out is like Capella 46 and we've also talked about Arcturus and the vicinity of Earth which is 3.2 uh, 32.6 light years in diameter near Aldebaran. So Aldebaran is one of the sections that has been mentioned in the Forever War, which um, Ridley Scott has cited as inspiration. And I think uh, a lot of um, stuff written around this period kind of um, reference, references that uh, planetary area as well, uh, mainly because it is, there's a possibility that it could support life. Uh, so one of the things in here, it says as of uh, 2087 AD 14 Earth colonies on planets or other systems in Earth vicinity space but none beyond so if you know I have been uh, categorizing the planets that were investigated or colonized by uh, Wayland Megacorp so this is all this like viral stuff that appeared in uh, Prometheus and I believe that that's what they've done when they made all of the colonies for Prometheus is that they've worked up to 14 colonies as well so you'll see as I go along um, how many were put into the prequel film and how a lot of it actually refers to um, Dan O'Bannon's original script and this is kind of why I love Alien and Prometheus and Alien Covenant is because it really references a lot of unused ideas that were in the original script. <sighs> okay. <laughs> I'm all right. I just needed a little breathe. Okay. So, uh, one of the things, uh, hold on, uh, one second, because there's been a bit of chatting. So <laughs> I didn't check the, uh, Twitch stream, I apologize. I'm doing that now. Was there any mention at all of Lambert being trans in the original script or was that retroactively added in Aliens? Okay. Uh, Lambert was made into a woman for Alien and then only in Aliens was that retroactively inferred and even then it was only in the background. So, uh, then, <laughs> so people have said different things and I don't know what to believe. Some people say that the reason why Lambert is referred to as having, um, a really early, uh, sexual assignment was because, uh, James Cameron or, whoever was in charge of uh, the background pictures that were used in Aliens, all of those slides, that they were trying to say that they were paying homage to the fact that both Ripley and Lambert were originally male characters and they were changed to female. Or it could be referencing the fact that the alien was like it's it doesn't have a sex so it's it can't be a girl it can't be a guy it's the same thing <laughs> so that's why um that's why 
Lambert has that in the background, but I honestly think it was just something someone did with no particular thought put into it. And that's the best thing about the sci-fi movies. We kind of impress or put our thoughts onto the movie and that's what makes it for us and that's what makes it interesting. So it's really what you take away from it. I don't think it affected Lambert's character at all. It was something that was added later on in Aliens and it was never originally in the original Alien script. But in the original Alien script, as you can see, um, the crew is unisex and they can be either parts interchangeable for women or men. So, you know, Lambert's parts were interchangeable for a woman or a man as well. I don't know. You take from it what you want. Um, but for me, I always felt like there was some sort of like very full representation of, of different types of people, whether it be race or sex, um, gender or religion in Alien. And it never really affected how their character acted. And I don't feel like it affected Lambert's character. And But I do think that um, it affected the characters in Alien 3 because Dylan and all the prisoners, they were all religious and it was for a purpose. And I believe that that was the case for Aram as well because he his character is a religious man. Um, but other than that, those are the only things that affected the way they acted. Whereas I feel like for, um, for Lambert, no one would have known. It was done early on. Lambert could have been born with both male and female genitalia and it was changed early on by the parents. So it, it wasn't really as sexual reassignment um, by her choice. It was kind of enforced on her or him. <laughs> Okay, so uh, that's all right. Um, ah, the map of Thetis. I don't think Thetis is in this map, but you know what? Nostromo files have a really detailed um, galaxy map. So I'll link that into uh, the Discord. Just give me a sec. So I'm going to copy this into both um, Twitch and Discord for you. All right, because I'm running so many apps. It's kind of going slow. Okay, so there's not exactly a spot for Thetis, but it's there. And it's okay, don't worry about all of the questions. <laughs> the Earth is definitely not flat, um, Master of Pigeons. I don't understand. Like I've I've watched that um, documentary about flat Earth, and it just most of the people who are in those groups are mainly there because they like socializing, and it's I I think it's strange that people would take that seriously. <laughs> so no, I'm not going to give any more time to flat Earth. If people want to debate that somewhere else, then that's fine. But I'm not a flat Earth believer. Um, okay, so on Twitch, um, there's a big 35 year old mystery in Elite Dangerous. I believe it may be connected with star systems in the alien universe. If it would be possible to get some ideas at some point from you, that'd be great. I found two clues that suggest the mystery is related to alien. Yeah, sure. I would love to help you out. Just, uh, 
just bother me on my Discord. So for those people who don't know, I run an, a Discord for my blog, um, but I'm also part of the LV426 Discord and you can reach me there as well. Let me find... Get a link. All right. Oh, all of my apps are slowing down. All right. Here's my Utani Discord. Join. Cool. All right, let's get back to the scripts. So for those following us at home, we're on the first script just after the star map. Extreme close-ups of flickering instrument panels. Readouts and digital displays pulse eerily with the technology of the distant future. Wherever we are, it seems to be chill, dark, and sterile. Electronic machinery chuckles softly to itself. Abruptly, we hear a beeping signal and the machinery begins to waken. Sorry, awaken. <laughs> Circuits close, lights blink on. The camera, angles the camera angles gradually widen, revealing more and more of the machinery. Banks of panels, fluttering gauges, until we reveal interior hypersleep vault a stainless steel room with no windows the walls packed with instrumentation the lights are dim and the air is frigid occupying most of the floor space are rows of horizontal freezer compartments looking for all the world like meat lockers Foom, 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 <laughs> with explosions of escaping gas. The lids of the freezers pop open. Slowly, groggily, six nude men sit up. Roby. Oh God, I... <laughs> Sorry. Oh God, am I cold? Brassard. Is that you, Roby? Roby. I feel like shit. Brassard. Yeah, it's you, all right. Now they are yawning, stretching, and shivering. Let's go on to page two because we all know this is the waking up sequence in Alien. We'll talk about the differences in a sec. Page two. Faust groans. Oh. I must be alive. I feel dead. Brassard says, you look dead. Malconis says, the vampires rise from their graves. This draws a few woozy chuckles. Brassard shakes his fists in the air triumphantly. We made it. Hunter, not fully awake. Is it over? Standard says, it's over, Hunter. Hunter yawns. Oh, boy, that's terrific. Standard, looking around with a grin. Well, how does it feel to be rich men? Faust just shouts out, gold! <laughs> and this also draws a laugh from everyone. Standard says, okay, everybody, top side. Let's get our pants on and get to our posts. The men begin to swing out of the freezers. Malconis says, Somebody get the cat. Roby picks up a limp cat out of a freezer. Okay, so here we go. Page one and page two. So one of the noticeable things is that uh, we know that the hypersleep room is doesn't look anything like a meat locker, 
but I'd like to draw the fact, draw um, draw attention to the fact that in aliens, when they wake up from hypersleep, it looks more like a meat locker because we're looking at military. Everything is stainless steel, but in alien, they voted to go for the very cushy, squishy room <laughs> where all the hypersleep faults are. Um, and Roby ex exclaiming that uh, he's cold is another link to um, aliens as well because it's something that Hudson says and the um, uh, the was it Colonel Captain um, tells him off for saying that his feet are cold. <laughs> uh, also with um i believe it's faust who's supposed to be kane says that they feel like the death and that's something that um kane says in alien as well which is kind of the foreshadowing of what's going to happen to him and that's something that they used in alien covenant 2 uh or not so much alien covenant itself but in uh, the short film called The Last Supper, where Branson talks about feeling like he's burning up and then he, you know, suffers an ironic death. So make of that what you will. I think that I, I really liked that sort of aspect being brought up in the prequels and in Aliens, uh, these sorts of ideas being revisited. Uh, as well as that, talking about coming to this place or this planet, uh, this job, just for the money. And um, that's Faust as well. And, um, you know, he was the one who wanted to go into uh, the pyramid to be able to... Sorry, I might have to like sk skip a bit, but um, uh, so he's the one who voted to go and check out the pyramid because he wanted to see if there was any gold down there, basically. <laughs> and uh, this introduction of Jones really early on, and there's no name for Jones, which is really interesting. Um, so yeah, so there's there's a lot of similarities, I guess. Uh, with alien and aliens and that's something that the guys at av uh sorry at a perfect orbit organism podcast uh checking out i was saying avp galaxy way too much about the script and now I'm getting mixed up but the guys at perfect organism podcast are going through aliens and talking about how a lot of themes are very sim similar so that's uh something um that they've been bringing up and that's you can just listen to their podcast to kind of hear the sort of similarities they did one just recently about um, whether alien is overrated sorry aliens is overrated compared to aliens okay uh so i guess there is a sort of like mateship here there's this general sort of um banter going on between the characters and i think because they're written as men and even though they were changed to male and female later on especially with the ways that they were kind of thinking of dressing the females in hypersleep with no no cover on their boobs at all kind of exactly the same as the men um kind of shows that in the future there's not really uh, a difference between men and women um there's sexism doesn't seem to prevail anywhere uh, and, and the sort of like united disrespect for Ripley that um, Brett and Parker show is kind of just a that sort of feeling towards authority and not so much because Ripley is a woman so I don't think um, a lot of themes in this uh, at least in the 80s can kind of be looked through the same lens as kind of the way we see things now and the way that they use uh, women in film or the ways women was were used in film to make some sort of political statement 
Uh, I think it, when it came to Alien, it was just about the relationship between uh, corporate entities and the workers. Anyway, boring stuff. <laughs> uh, the next uh, two pages, uh, we go to the interior control room. Uh, they describe it. This is a fantastic circular room jammed with instrumentation. There are no windows, but above head level, the room is ringed by view screens, all blank for the moment. There are seats for four men. Each chair faces a console and is surrounded by a dazzling array of technology. Standard Roby and Brassard and Malconis are entering and finding their seats. Brassard says, I'm going to go buy a cattle ranch. Roby putting down the cat. Cattle ranch? Brassard says, I'm not kidding. You can get one if you have the credit. Look, just like real cows too. Standard says, all right, tycoons, let's stop spending our credit and start worrying about the job at hand. Roby says, right, fire up all systems. They begin to throw switches, lighting up their consoles. The control room starts to come to life. All around the room, colored lights flicker and chase each other across glowing screens. The room fills with the hum and chatter of machinery. Sandy, you want to give us some vision? So that's Malconis. Malconis says, feast your eyes. Malconis reaches to his console and presses the bank of switches. The strip of view screens flicker to life. On each screen, we see blackness speckled with stars. Brassard says after a pause, where's Earth? And this is kind of weird, the way that it's been spelt by Dan O'Bannon. He spells Earth um, with I-R-T-H, which is not the way it's spelt. So I don't know whether this is a sci-fi thing or a American thing. <laughs> Anyway, so Standard says, Sandy, scan the whole sky. So Malconis hits the buttons. On the screens, the images all begin to pan. The camera moves in on one of the screens with its moving image of a star field. Exterior, outer space. Close shot of a panning TV camera. This camera is remote controlled and turning silently on its base. Camera begins to pull back, revealing that the TV camera is mounted on the hull of some kind of craft. When the pullback is finished, we see the full length of a starship, the Snark. Hanging in the depths of the interstellar space against the background of shimmering stars. Interior bridge, Roby says. Where are we? Stan Standard says, Sandy, contact tra traffic control. <laughs> Sorry, lisp. Malconis switches on his radio unit. Malconis then says, this is deep space version. Oh, sorry. I'm, I've also got um, dyslexia for those who don't know. So I'm sorry if I can't read very well. <laughs> I apologize. But I'm persistent, so we'll get through this. This is Deep Space Commercial Vessel Snark. Registration number E180246. Calling Antarctica Air Traffic Control. Do you read me? Over. There are only, sorry, there is only the hiss of static. Brassard, staring at a screen. I don't recognize that constellation. Okay, so that's pages three and four. Uh, one of the things I'd like to draw attention to is uh, the circular room uh, with instrumentation. So that is 
what they kind of changed the hypersleep bay into and the bridge or the control room changed to what we see in alien now which is kind of like more of a standard uh, ship arrangement so brassard kind of makes this throwaway claim and this is something that one of the members of um the uh, i think lv426 uh reddit uh one of the guys off reddit mentioned to me that in this script they talk about um fake cows that look real and he asked could that be the link to the fact that both alien and blade runner are in the same universe and we know like that's kind of um a reach there well it seems like a reach for some people but you've got to remember the um the test in the beginning um Um, in uh, Blade Runner I was sorry not, not the test in the beginning it was later on um, they talk about a calfskin wallet and whether the leather was real or not uh, and I think that they said that could this part in the script be a homage to Blade Runner um, and I honestly don't know That's, that would be something that Dan O'Bannon would be able to confirm, but unfortunately, you know, he's uh, not with us anymore. Um, but like I said, the thing that I love about sci-fi and the alien universe is we can kind of put our own meaning into things that we read. And I think that's kind of cool. It's a really great idea um, that this could have been Dan O'Bannon's way of either saying in the future, uh, there only exists clones of cows because all real cows wouldn't survive in space or exist or they are extinct or it could be uh the same sort of commentary that blade runner makes when they say uh that there are no more real animals and everything that is um worth treasuring is a, a replicant so i don't know it's it's up to you but i think it's kind of neat it's, a, it's an idea that's worth thinking about and kind of pondering <laughs> Um, one of the other things that's uh, mentioned in here uh, is the number for the Nostromo, which they keep the same uh, or, or relatively the same. So, um, but a, th a thing that they did change is the name of the ship. Uh, in here, the vessel is called the Snark. <laughs> and as you know, that's not... Uh, what the Nostromo is called now um, but that's what it was called early on currently I forget the reason why it was called the Snark but someone has told me and I will include it in the footnotes later but right now my anxiety is playing with my health so I'm, I'm sorry to be doing this with not the sort of preparedness that I usually have <laughs> but I really wanted to get this out and get this done um, Yesterday we had St. Patrick's Day celebrations outside the front of my house where there was about 5,000 people drinking <laughs> and it's been a noisy night and you can hear it now probably um, the trucks going back and forth trying to sort through all of uh, this festival stuff that's out there so I'm sorry about the noise as well. All right now we're going to page five and six standard goes Dell plot our location Brassard goes into action pushing buttons lighting up all his instruments Brassard I got it oh boy where the hell are we says standard Brassard says just short of Zeta 2 reticuli we haven't even reached the outer rim yet so like we mentioned before 108 Roby says what the hell standard picks up a microphone standard says this is Chaz speaking sorry 
but are we not home? Our present location seems to be the only, oh, sorry, seems to be only halfway to Earth. Remain at your posts and stand by. That is all. Roby says, Chaz, I've got something here in my security alert. A high priority from the computer. Standard says, let's hear it. Roby punches buttons. Computer, you have signaled a priority three message. What is the message? The computer says in a mechanical voice. I have interrupted the course of the voyage. Roby says, what, why? The computer responds. I am programmed to do so if certain conditions arise. Standard then says, computer, this is Captain Standard. What conditions are you talking about? The computer replies, I have intercepted a transmission of unknown origin. Standard says, a transmission? The computer says, a voice transmission. Malconis says, out here? The men exchange glances. The computer responds, I have recorded the transmission. Standard says, play it for us, please. Over the speakers, we hear a hum, a crackle, static. Then a strange, unearthly voice fills the room, speaking in an alien language. The bizarre voice speaks a long sentence, then falls silent. The men all stare in each other in amazement. Standard says, Computer, what language was that? Computer replies, Unknown. Roby says, Unknown? What do you mean? All right, so in this page here, this is the standard intercept of the signal which the Nostromo comes across. I think in at least in Alien Covenant, they kind of paid homage to this, um, intercepting a ghostly transmission from Elizabeth Shaw. And it's interesting that in the case of her being on Planet 4, she is the alien. So, so this is kind of, yeah, interesting and weird. Um, the transmission, which Sir Peter Wayland, uh, gives an inkling to knowing about in the Prometheus Blu-ray, which I believe was written by Charles de la Zarica. Um, and the transmission in which, uh, was constantly playing over, which I think was just the, uh, the engineers, um, dying again and again, being played over in the projections. And I don't know whether it was just David that activated them, but I, I feel, and I believe that the signal was coming way before David arrived, but his, um, touching of the controls may have triggered it again to play. <sighs> All right. It's interesting as well that the computer doesn't have a name yet. Whereas we know the computer as mother and, um, since Ash is not here as well, there is this immediate, uh, kind of connection with the computer and everyone, uh, in the crew as apart from like Dallas, just inquiring with mother, what it could be about. So it's interesting how they, it, how it plays out on screen with Dallas typing instead of um, the computer's voice. Whereas in Alien Covenant, in Prometheus, the interaction with the crew is always through voice. And it's not just specifically the captain, the computer can kind of talk to everyone. So I'm feeling okay now. I'm shaking a little less. <laughs> Let's go on to page seven and eight. So the computer says, it is none of the 678 dialects spoken by technological man. There is a pause. 
Then everybody starts talking at the same time. Standard silences everyone by shouting, Just hold it, hold it. And he glares around the room. The computer says, Have you attempted to analyze the transmission? Oh no, uh, I think standard says to the computer. I don't know why it says the computer says. The next part the computer does say, yes, there are two points of salient interest. Number one, it is highly systematized, indicating intelligent origin. Number two, certain sounds are inconsistent with the human palate. Roby responds, oh my God. Standard replies, well, it's finally happened. Malconis says, First contact. Standard says, Sandy, can you home in on that beam? Malcona says, what's the frequency? Standard says, computer, what's the frequency of the transmission? The computer responds with 65330-99. Malcona punches buttons. Malconis says, I've got it. It's coming from ascension, six minutes, 32 seconds, declension, minus 39 degrees, two seconds. Standard says, Dell, show me that on the screen. And Brassard responds with, I'll give it to you on number four. Brassard punches, punches some buttons. One of the view screens flicker and a small dot of light becomes visible in the corner of the screen. That's it. Let me straighten it out. He twists the knob, moving the image of the screen until the dot is in the center. Standard says, can you get a, a little closer? Brassard says, that's what I'm gonna do. He hits a button and the screen flashes and a planet appears. Brassard continues, Planetoid diameter, 120 kilometers. Orconus responds, it's tiny. Standard says, any rotation? Brassard says, yeah, two hours. Standard asks, gravity? Brassard says, 0.86, we can walk on it. Standard rises. Standard says, Martin, Get the others up to the lounge. All right. So much stuff to take in on pages seven and eight and so many similarities between uh, Alien Covenant and the way that they kind of discover Planet Four. Uh, so there's that recognition that the sound coming from the transmission is alien but then in alien covenant obviously they have this recognition that the sound coming from the planet is human uh, and they also talk about where the planet is located and it's kind of funny because when i spoke to um brad tucker who helped out with alien covenant with the uh, astronomical stuff he spoke about how you would say um about uh the arrangement of planets and stars and the location of the planet and it's kind of exactly the way that dan o'bannon did this in the original alien script but it's also the way that um real scientists uh real astronomers talk about the location of a planet as well so i kind of really appreciate dan o'bannon and and the sort of um reality he brought, brought to the alien scripts, the original scripts, and, and that's something that they continued to do in Alien Covenant. They say the position of the uh, the planet um, word for word with what Brad has recommended, but this is also the style that Melconis's character says it in the original Alien script, so I think that's kind of cool. Um, even the way that they bring it up on screen after they get the transmission and um, where it is. Yeah, it's kind of interesting. Yep, 
yeah so a lot of these um sizes and measurements are not what made it to alien but there are a couple of numbers that they did kind of have in the later script which um i'll i'll go through as well i think that we'll go through all the different iterations of the script um in a way uh, then we can talk about the changes that were made but yeah 120 kilometers and 0.86 g's is just it's not science <laughs> that part is right but where it's located in the sky it's it's interesting that's the way that they identify it okay um and yeah we'll we'll talk about these numbers and and how unrealistic they are but how how dan kind of wouldn't have known as well um or, or we don't know he wouldn't have known but we are just assuming well this is kind of like a draft script where they kind of write any sort of number in but a lot of this sort of stuff did make it to the final script oh yeah that's what i wanted to remember um in alien covenant when they suffered from the uh, explosion of that star dying um, they were in sector 106 and planet 4 is located in sector 108 and it just happens that in this map the outer rim is 108 so I don't know whether that's also a homage to the original script um, but yeah, like I think, I think that's a cool little Easter egg. At least I, I feel like there's a link there. All right, and um, I think these will be the last pages because after this social interaction, I'm needing a bit of a recharge because <laughs> my nerves are a bit frayed. So I'm, I'm sorry I'm going to be cutting it short with you guys, but I've really enjoyed doing this. I'm really glad I'm doing this, and we'll continue on with pages. Um, 12 to 20 either um, tomorrow or uh, later on tonight I'll, I'll see how I'm feeling okay <laughs> all right interior multi-purpose room the entire crew standard Roby Brassard Malconis and Hunter and Faust are all seated around a table with standard at the head Malcona says, if it's an SOS, we're morally obligated to investigate. And Brassard says, right. <laughs> Hunter says, I don't know. Seems to me we came on this trip to make some credit, not to go off on some kind of side trip. Brassard responds excitedly. Forget about the credit. What we have here is a chance to be the first men to contact non-human intelligence. Roby responds with, If there's some kind of alien intelligence down there on that planetoid, it'd be a serious mistake for us to blunder in unequipped. Brassard responds with, Hell we're equipped. Roby responds with, Hell no. We don't know what's down there on that piece of rock it might be dangerous what we should do is get on the radio to the exploration authorities let them deal with it standard replies with except it will take 75 days to get a reply back don't forget how far we are from the colonies martin brassard says there are no commercial lanes out here face it we're out of range Malconis replies, men have waited centuries to contact another form of intelligent life in the universe, and this is an opportunity which may never come again. Roby says, look. Standard replies, you're overruled, Martin. Gentlemen, let's go. Interior bridge. The men are strapping in, but this time it's with a grim determination. Dell, I want greater magnification, more surface detail. I want to see this place, oh, sorry, I want to see what this place looks like. Brassard responds, I'll see what I can do. He jabs his controls 
The image on the screen zooms down toward the planet, but all the detail quickly vanishes into a fe featureless grey haze. Standard replies, It's out of focus. Roby replies with, No, that's atmosphere. Cloud layer. Malconus says in response, my god, it's stormy for a piece of rock that size. Roby says, just a second. And punches some buttons. Those aren't water vapor clouds. They have no moisture content. Standard responds. Put the ship in atmospheric mode, which I think is atmospheric orbit. All right, pages nine and ten again. <laughs> a lot of similarities with uh, Prometheus and Alien Covenant. Um, everyone in the crew is around the table, so that's that part in Alien when they're all gathered around and they're talking about going down onto the planet and who's going to go. And that kind of discussion also happens uh, in Alien Covenant as well. You know, people don't want to get back in the pods. They want to go down and check the planet. Hi, by Standard Crux. Yeah, that's right. Probably 1,200 kilometers in diameter. But uh, I'll double check all of the numbers and see what we ended up finalized with in, um, in the movie. So uh, Malconus is saying um, we're morally obligated to investigate. And that's something that uh, the characters bring up in Covenant uh, for a reason to go down and check it out. So, in here, they're talking about being equipped and not equipped for the situation. So this is kind of like that conversation that Daniels ends up having with Captain Oram. Oram's saying, you know, we're going to go down there. We're going to go check it out. Uh, Roby Ripley, the voice of reason, is saying, no, we shouldn't go do that. It's not our job. Let's have someone else uh, investigate. And then Standard uh, bites back with, it'll take 75 years to get a reply back. So they're talking about uh, sending messages in um, the alien universe. And I think uh, in terms of canon with, um, sorry, Thousand by Standard Crux. Um, in talking in terms of canon, in some entries into the alien universe, we've got uh, messages sent via quantum entanglement so it's instantaneous we've also got transmissions which can take time because it takes time for characters to travel from one place to another which is referenced in aliens as well as alien 3 uh, so there's no hard and fast rule in regards to transmissions and how long it will take but in at least alien covenant uh, they make the inkling that transmissions take time especially being uh especially being transmitted um via encrypted satellites sorry took me a while to get the words out so so this argument that uh Roby has um, is yeah very similar to the one that Daniels has with um, uh, Aram in Alien Covenant, uh, except in here, Standard says that um, you know you're you're overruled, but I guess in Alien Covenant it was the same with Daniels as well. But then she says I want to make an official complaint, so he has to note it in the log. As, as well as for the stormy atmosphere as well. So the stormy atmosphere was still prevalent in uh, Alien and it was still kind of present in Aliens even though the planet was still undergoing terraformation and um, the military could still be outside without breathing apparatus or apparati. And that was something that they kept also in uh, Prometheus and in Alien Covenant. 
So. Yeah. Um. So, I'll save this for next time when we talk about uh, pages 11 onwards. It might be tonight, it might be tomorrow. Um, it'll be soon. Uh, but yeah, let me know what you think about um, the initial uh, page about the characters um, and up to page 10 and what we've covered so far and, and how you think about Alien now, knowing um, how much had changed in the script versus how much we see in the movie. Sorry, if there's something that um, one of the guys is bringing up on Twitch, it's talking about the size of the planet. So I'm just going to turn to that page now and show you guys. So um, the, the planet is 120 kilometers. I'm just going to hold it up a bit more. I don't know whether you can see it from this, like my camera is a bit slow. 120 kilometers, okay? That's what it says. That's what Brassard says. Planetoid diameter 120 kilometers. That is really small. <laughs> it's so weird. But like I said, this is a draft script. So we've got the accuracy of, of how you talk about a constellation uh, where Dan O'Bannon has put in pretty much what they said in Alien Covenant, talking about um, uh, its declination and so on, but then he talks about the planet being tiny, as big as 120 kilometers wide. So it's just in diameter. It's just strange. Uh, but that's that's what it says in the script. So yeah, um, yeah. What do you guys think about the name changes? So I've added two links um, to the. Uh, the blog entry which I've put on the Patreon page this time. Um, so the blog links, uh, the name changes and um, the idea that uh, David Jyla and Walter Hill tried to take credit for the script. So we'll be going through the scripts and you'll be able to see how many changes that were made between the original scripts that Dan O'Bannon wrote and the final scripts and then I guess you can give me your own opinion about whether Dan O'Bannon was more responsible for Alien or David Jyler and Walter Hill were. Okay let me just link to the original Alien script, hold on. Drafts by Dan O'Bannon. It's the very first one, but I'm going to pop the link into Discord. Oops. All caps. <laughs> and I'll pop it into Twitch as well. Just in case there's other people playing later on <laughs> as well as being in Australia I'm, I'm really lagged out um, so what do you think about uh, the name changes I personally think the names are really weird but then again um, the the original names for uh, Shaw in 
Prometheus were pretty bad too. So I'm kind of glad that they changed it. Um, so so Dallas uh, is is now Ch Chaz Standard. Uh, I don't like it. <laughs> um, oh, one interesting point to bring up is in the fifth element, they kind of pay homage to um, Dallas as well. Um, the main character is Corbin Dallas. Uh, in Alien, his name is also uh, Arthur Corbin Dallas. So yeah, that's interesting. Um, Martin Roby. So it's interesting that Ripley becomes Ellen Ripley. Uh, Martin Roby. Yeah, also not a big fan of the name. <laughs> so so Martin Roby is Ripley. Uh, Chaz Standard is Dallas. And then we've got um, Brassard, uh, who's the navigator, who is obviously Lambert. And um, yeah, so Del Brassard. Del, uh, I kind of like Del, I don't like the name Brassard. <laughs> and then Sandy Malconis. That's just, <laughs> it's so weird, that name. Um, yeah. I rather prefer Kane. <laughs> um, uh, and and the reason why um, Kane was chosen, I believe, was because of the the sort of religious inkling that was. I don't like. I don't even know whether that was the, the reason why they changed Kane's name to Kane, but there's a lot of things in Alien that kind of point to religious or uh, biblical themes just because of um, the idea of creation and maybe it's a, a meaning that was put on it later but I believe that Cain was chosen because of Cain and Abel um, and that's another theme that was revisited in the prequels as well um, uh, Walter and David funnily enough named after Walter Hill and David Jailer um, but who are brothers and fight um, and I think um, in Alien they're talking about Cain being the one who loses uh, loses a fight against the facehugger and then becomes the alien and uh, in um, Alien Covenant you've got Walter and David fighting and Walter loses and David becomes Walter to get onto the Covenant. So I think that's kind of interesting. <laughs> anyway, and then we've got um, uh, Brett and um, Parker, which is Cleve Hunter and Jay Faust. So like even, even the inkling that, not inkling, sorry, even the response that some of the characters come up with are exactly the same as, as the way the characters act later on once they've changed. So I personally don't think that David Gyler and Walter Hill can kind of take um, credit for that, but they can definitely take credit for Ash, who was added on later. Um, and the fact that the crew, I, again, like I said, is unisex, um, they... They definitely feel, I don't know, like to me, they kind of feel blokey. <laughs> like they, they kind of fit the um, stereotype of, of the way men act on a ship. But at the same time, uh, people could act this way when they're fairly close to people who are long haul or working together for long periods of time. Um, and I believe that if you go look into um, the additional timeline around Alien, which is available on the Nostromo Files website, you'll be able to see the back history that was added in, uh, which is not really canon, but it was added in by Charles de la Zurica when he was making uh, the Alien uh, DVD. Um, to have additional information 
Um, and that was added later on, I believe. Um, if I'm wrong, please correct me. But um, I'll be adding in all the links and stuff like that that we've discussed so far. Um, and exactly how it's been said in the movies or the looks of the things that were um, written in the script and then played out in later movies in um, a blog post later on. And, and then we can go on to pages um, 11 to 20 and talk about how they're different or, or the same as a lot of other alien movies. So yeah, that's pretty much it. Thank you for joining me and I will catch you guys later on and hopefully um, my anxiety won't be as bad anymore. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I also wanted to um, thank uh, Tim Kulin, Kulin, sorry if I mispronounced your name, uh, Tim just joined um, my Patreon this morning on uh, the $10 tier, which is very much appreciated. Uh, thank you very much. If you would like to support the uh, podcasts, live casts, interviews, all the things that we do, including um, our Alien Day giveaway. Uh, join us on Patreon or subscribe to Utani.studio um, and yeah just uh, keep an eye on Instagram because I will be sharing uh, pictures of more things that I'll be giving away on Alien Day to the people in the alien community so there's there's things that are for free that are donated by members so if you have anything in your alien community collection that you'd like to give up, a sticker, a patch, um, a bookmark, a collector card, a figurine, a comic, whatever. Um, if you'd like to give it away, when you donate, uh, you just pay for the postage to go to the winner and and that's it. I, you don't send it to me. Um, prizes uh, that I've bought with my money uh, will go towards people who are specifically on um, supporting me on Patreon. So it goes to people who already invest money into the community. And um, so part of the free prizes this year is we got a special um, storyboard print from Alien Covenant. Uh, and that was donated by a Patreon supporter, Benjamin Scottford. So that's what we'll be drawing on Alien Day from the community. Uh, I would also uh, be giving away a donated, donated copy of uh, Alien the Cold Forge by author Alex White. So I just have to give him the address of the winner and he will sign it and send a copy out to you. Um, I've also got a full size AO uh, Alien Covenant poster which I will be giving away. Um, and I, I think that I will be giving away a copy of David's drawings, but I'm still, I'm still waiting on, on word back. So just let me, just let me sort that out first before I officially announce it. But, but that's, that's the plan. And there's a couple of other things that people have donated to like their, um, their digital, uh, copies or licenses of alien movies. If you've bought an alien movie, and then you get the digital download as well and you don't want to use it, you can give it to someone else. And usually people post it on Reddit or they give it out to the community on Alien Collectors. You can hand a code to me and I will just give it out on Alien Day. You just let me know what you want to do. Um, if you'd like to give away your old uh, uh, Alien um, DVDs, Blu-rays as well, give them away. Um, as part of uh, the draw for Alien Day, let me know um, and we could do that as well. So just to recap, if you donate, you pay for the postage for the prize to go out to the winner. Um, I'm not overly rich this year. I've had to invest a lot of money into my studio project, which is Claw Creative Studios, a physical, actual place. Um, inspired by the creative series which I created for Studio Utani. Um, so if you donate th that'll be you giving 
your money and time and your personal belonging to the community. And if you do that, I'm so much forever grateful. And thank you very much for donating. Um, and if you can't, then that's okay. If you can contribute only a dollar uh, to Studio Yutani for Alien Day, do it. Um, yeah, I'll be appreciative of anything that you can put towards. If you can't do any of those things at all, that's totally cool. There are people in our community who can't afford to be generous or have a lot of money to kind of be philanthropic uh, towards others, and that's cool. Just make the community a better place by discussing alien and being respectful of other people's opinions and kind of uh, accepting that we all like different things about the alien universe and yeah just because we like different things doesn't mean that we can't get along anyway <laughs> i've done long enough now um you can reach me on uh utani.studio you can reach me on twitter instagram tumblr facebook uh i'm also on twitch as you know right now and you could also see me um around Melbourne because I will be having a Alien Day screening at Claw Creative Studios. So if you're in Melbourne and would like to watch the 4K version of Alien uh, Director's Cut for free um, with my projector <laughs> that I'll be getting really soon, laser projector, um, then yeah, you can come down to the studio. Uh, a $2 uh, donation or a $1 donation, gold coin donation to me, we'll provide you with free popcorn, but you bring your own drink. Um, and we remind you to drink responsibly if you do bring alcohol. And basically, yeah, the screening is because I'm a really big fan of Alien and I'd like to invite other people to come and join me. So I'm not watching it by myself, but I don't mind if I do because I do all the time. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. And I promise you that there'll be a a more thorough and better update on the blog that you can follow up later on with all of my notes. All right. Uh, this is mother of Studio Yutani signing off. <laughs>